Hello. Do you watch crime shows like Criminal Mind, CSI, Castle was a great one? Do you enjoy them? If you do, then you know that the appeal of law enforcement is a great element of writing today, both in, in all media, from film to TV to writing books. But how do you do that in a fantasy world? That's what I would like to talk about today, law enforcement in a fantasy world. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds. How I'm going to break down today's topic is first I'm going to address some historical models from, the, from our real world history. I will talk about things like the tithing man model and I will talk about the state as a law enforcer. I'll briefly touch on the Roman model of law enforcement and I will address our modern law enforcement. Once we've taken a look at some of the historical models of law enforcement, I'll move on to how magic impacts law enforcement. And then finally, I will give you a flow chart to decide what kind of law enforcement model you would like to use in your fantasy world. What I'm not going to cover is the actual prosecution of criminals, so how do you decide who's guilty? I'm not going to just I'm not going to cover criminal punishment, and I'm definitely not going to cover the creation of laws. The creation of laws is for my series on governments in fantasy, which I will get around to soon. But if you are interested in prosecution of uh, criminals, as in how do you decide that people are guilty? Comment below, let me know, and I will add it to the list for future videos. My name is Marie Mullaney. This is Just In Time Worlds. If you really like this content, please do hit the like button. If you really, really like it, I do have an account over at coffee.com forward slash Just In Time Worlds, where you can buy me a cup of coffee for one euro if you'd like to support me in this endeavor. Okay, let's get cracking. One of the most interesting historical models is the tithing model. So there's a great article about this, which I will link below, a historical article on it, if you want to go research in more detail. But the essence of the tithing model is 10 families are organized into a tithe. There is a tithing man who is in charge of that tithe of families, and then 10 tithings are organized into a hundred. Okay, so far so good. But what does that actually mean? If the courts, which are run by the king or the local lord, find that somebody in the tithing has been guilty of a crime, then everybody in the tithing, every man over the age of 12, must participate in the hue and cry to find the criminal. So they raise the hue and cry and then the hue and cry must be kept going from tithing to tithing to find the criminal. If the hundred cannot produce a criminal that has been judged to be guilty and must be brought to justice, the entire hundred can be punished by the courts. So the whole system is kind of a pledging system where the sin of one is the sin of all, which makes for such a great mechanic to really get people into trouble for something that they have zero control over. So you're in this tithing or in this hundred and some dude over there has, you know, stolen the Lord's cows and suddenly you're in trouble because no one can find him. It provides such great story motivation for people to get dumped into an adventure. I'm honestly, I am amazed that it is not used more often in fantasy. A linguistic side note, the hundreds were organized into shires and the person who was in charge of a shire, who was expected to keep the king's peace in the shire, was called a shire reeve, which is the origin of our word sheriff. And that's kind of cool, isn't it? That it's that old and it comes from that kind of historical precedent. I use tithe, the tithing men system in my northern duchy. In my empire, there are different law enforcement structures in different regions. 
And in the, in the north, they use what they call the kemaiks, which is like the tithings. As I said, I think that it is a system that provides so much potential for plot tension and conflict. But it's not the only historical system, so let's move along and check out some others. That's a nice little shop you got there. It'd be a damn shame if something happened to it. Normally, we would associate a phrase like that with criminal activity rather than law enforcement. But this wasn't always the case. Protectionism, even protectionism not offered by the state or partially sponsored by the state, can be a law enforcement model where you basically privatize law enforcement and instead of funding it through taxation, you expect that people will fund the protection of their assets and their property by means of directly paying a gang to both not damage their property and ensure that no other gangs can damage their property. Tamora Pierce implemented this in her children's series around the Provost God. Links down below as always and on the whiteboard. Where the Provost God had a happy bag that they took around to businesses and collected donations from. They also were partially funded by taxes, but taxes couldn't cover their cost of living. So they literally got additional funding from the businesses that they were protecting. In Legend of the Five Rings, which is one of my favorite role-playing games, they have a fire brigade that if you don't pay them, your place will burn down. And that is actual state-sponsored, you know, organization. So protectionism like that can be a great element for plot both from the perspective of somebody refusing to pay protectionism or even from the perspective of somebody enforcing that protectionism. I mean, in Tamora Pierce's books, the main character was a member of the Provost God who went around with the happy bag to collect the donations, and it made for a great story. It can be partially funded by the state, which brings me to the model, the historical model of the state as the law enforcer in terms of a noble sending out his men at arms to procure criminals, oh, procure sounds terrible, to capture criminals, <laughs> or in terms of a uh, bounty being placed on people's heads and then there are designated people who can go and collect that bounty. So that was the model used by the thief takers in London as one of the precursors to modern policing. And if you want to check out the whole thief taker system, there's a great video by Extra Credits over there in the link, which I highly recommend. Catherine Kerr does this uh, procurement. Uh, there's me in procurement again. <laughs> does this capturing of criminals really well with her silver daggers. Now, a silver dagger is somebody who is exiled from their home and carries this item, which is called the silver dagger, that identifies them as a person who has misplaced their honor. And these silver daggers will sometimes hunt down criminals for the bounty that the lords will pay them, especially because silver daggers can cross borders between one lord's demise and another demise, whereas one lord's men at arms traveling into another lord's men at arms can result in war. So that's the state as a very basic law enforcement. But what about things like a town guard? Well, I know that it's an absolute trope to say that they didn't have a, they didn't have a town guard in the medieval era, and that is true, they didn't. But if you want a really complex law enforcement, you need to go a little bit further back than the medieval law enforcement and go take a look at the Roman system. Now, there is no way I can do the Roman system justice in this video. So if you want to check out a more in-depth view, there's a video by Invecta uh, linked in the info cards and linked down below. The Roman system was this amazing hodgepodge of law enforcement that were tied to the different positions in the Roman government, in the Roman Republic government. 
So the consul had their, had their guards. The other forms of magistrates had their guards. The tribunes had their guards. And they all enforced different portions of the law and had different jurisdiction and stepped over each other's toes and engaged in corruption and bribery on a scale we can barely comprehend. The whole system is so ready for corruption and tension and conflict that you can basically just pick it up and dump it into your fantasy world just like that and have this mess going on that is just glorious to observe. In the later Roman Empire, you had this organization called the Vigils that were firemen and basically local neighborhood watch. And you had the cohort urbana, who was like the SWAT of their day. And then you had the Praetorian Guard, who, I mean, the Praetorian Guard, to give you an idea, auctioned off, <laughs> literally auctioned off the role of emperor at one point. That is how powerful they were. So I made a short about Vigils over there, but honestly, like, it cannot possibly do it justice. So... If you want to use the Roman system, go take a look at the variety of, of resources around that. And it's a glorious mess. I took elements of it into my own world, into my law enforcement system, because it was just so, so pretty. Now, the Roman system reminds us a lot of the modern system. And let's briefly cover the modern law enforcement system. So, in the modern law enforcement system, it's basically a lot like the Roman, except that it is a lot more checks and balances. At least one hopes there's a lot more checks and balances and they're not auctioning off the emperorship. <laughs> and the other big difference resides in how you gather evidence. In all the systems before the modern day and age, the emphasis was on personal testimony because you didn't really have that kind of forensic access. In today's day and age, obviously with forensics available to you, that becomes a lot more of an investigative procedure and that informs your law enforcement quite strongly. That does start shading into the prosecution process though, um, but it is an interesting element to explore if you want to bring that for forensic element into your law enforcement. And that brings me to the impact that magic has on law enforcement. So the reason why it brings me to magic and law enforcement is because you can substitute magic for modern forensics. Raymond Face does this in Daughter of the Empire right at the end. There's a murder committed and there's the normal personal testimony argument going on. And then one of the magicians says, well, I'll settle this. And because he's a great one, his word carries the weight of the law. And he uses a spell to recreate the events, the what remains of the events, and show what had happened in the room. And that settled the argument of who was at fault in this particular uh, crime. You can also look at having officers of the law of some sort with magic, or if you're using one of those, you know, bounty hunter systems, it could be a mage that is following the criminal by means of using magic. You can have modern forensics without having modern science by building your magic system so that it can enforce forensics. But that's not the only impact that magic has. Magic can also be a crime, or it can help you commit crimes, either one of the two. In Harry Dresden, they use magic to create a drug called Three Eye, which is a magical drug, uh, as well as being a drug, and, can, and creates massive problems on the street. If you think about comic books, there's always this conflict of will the hero, you know, just walk into a bank vault and rob it with his special powers. So you can have magic influence your crimes that way. And of course, there's the very big problem of how do you contain a magician? So in Harry Dresden, again, there is a situation where Harry leaves an illusion of himself sitting in a jail cell while he walks out. 
you know, how do you contain a mage? How do you punish a mage? So it is definitely worth exploring exactly how you handle magic and its impact on law enforcement in your fantasy world. Okay, so let's take a look at how you should pick a model. Do you want to play with murder mysteries? Do you want to have investigations? Maybe you want to have your main character be a cop the way that Daniel Green does in his novella Breach of Peace. In that case, go with a modern system or go with the Roman system. Either one of the two gives you that jurisdictional dispute, access to some sort of forensics and some investigation and undercover work activities because you have multiple organizations working towards law enforcement. Maybe you don't really want to focus on law enforcement all the time, but all the time, but you do want to draw in your main character into law enforcement activities like hunting down a criminal or capturing an outlaw or something equivalent to that. In that case, look towards the tithing system, the hue and cry style of system or look towards your state putting bounties on people's heads and those bounties being collected either by official collectors like thief takers or by any sort of mercenary who can pick up the bounty. Maybe what you want to do is you want to emphasize corruption and bribery in your world and how they impact law enforcement. In that case, look towards your protectionistic models or your Roman and modern models. Both of those have got Plenty scope for corruption and bribery. Maybe you want to dump your main characters or your player characters in a world of hurt without them having any control over it and now they're just in this really shitty situation that they have to cope with. In that case, definitely go for the tithing courts. Some dude has been accused of something and now suddenly you're responsible. Good luck. Finally, don't forget to think about how magic impacts everything about law enforcement and if it does. And that is my take on law enforcement in a fantasy world. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Just In Time Worlds. I will be back on Friday with another religion episode, this time spiritualism in a fantasy world. So I will see you then. Please do hit the like button, consider subscribing, and if you really liked it, Kofi.com forward slash just in time worlds to buy me a cup of coffee.